Okay, sorry about this. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you for um, letting me talk today. So I will talk about Japanism and especially the influence of Japanism in Paris and in the consumption of tea in Paris at the turn of the 20th century. So I'm just going down so that they can watch the screen. Okay. Okay, here we are. So the title of my study is A la Japonaise, Japanism and Japanese tea culture in Paris at the turn of the 20th century. So I made the study basically between 1858 and 1930 to give a wide um, frame. So um, uh, 1858, why? Because it's uh, the year of the Imperial Treaty uh, between France and Japan. So this is the first commercial treaty and the first cooperation treaty between France and Japan. Um, so it's signed between uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the time, which is Touvenel, and the last emperor uh, of Japan from the Kyo um, era, because then it turns to the Meiji era. So the article which is interested, which is interesting, sorry, for this topic is the article number eight. So I will just quote it. In every commercial harbor of Japan, French citizens shall be free to import from their own country or from foreign harbors and to sell and buy for their own harbors or for those of foreign countries, each kind of goods except those derived from contraband and will pay the rights mentioned in the appendix of this treaty without any further type of uh, tax. So it's signed on the October 9th of 15, 8, 1858 at Iedo, former Tokyo. And uh, we, can, uh, we can read it in the report um, on, in the diplomatic archives of um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the arbors concerned by this treaty are six. Uh, this is to say Yokohama, Kobe, Osaka, Akodate, Niigata, and Tokyo. But for French people, it was more Yokohama and Kobe because we know that uh, French people were settled. There were already a f community of French people living there. And uh, even all the traders, the French traders would go there to make trade and um, they, they wouldn't go to the other harbors. In this treaty, they mentioned some goods, uh, such as rice, textiles, and liquors, but there is no mention of tea at all. Um, but France began, begin, begins to be an important uh, trader with Japan because it, it is the first uh, trader in silk in silk industry, so a lot of uh, merchants of textiles are going there and are importing tissues, uh, tissues, sorry, textiles. Um, so this, co this commercial cooperation allows the circulation of goods and notably artistic goods such as prints, uh, yukiyo-e prints, and uh, imari porcelains notably. This creates a real enthusiasm among French galleries and collectioners like Siegfried Bing, uh, Philippe Berti, and Charles Cartier-Bresson. And this is how it begins um, Japanism uh, in France. Japanism or Japon Japonism, as uh, Philippe, Bert Philippe Berti, an art critic, called it at the time. So, um, uh, there are some objects related to tea uh, which will arrive in France in some collections, uh, such as uh, this teapot, this Japanese teapot from the Meiji era, acquired in 1891 by Philippe Berti. Also this one, uh, acquired by the artist uh, painter Gustave Moreau in 1898. And also this Shawan uh, depicting a helmet acquired in 1936 by Charles Cartier-Bresson. So they are all in the world of art, whether they are art critics, art, art galleries, or artists. So however, the prints will be more successful with uh, French people and um, artists such as uh, Claude Monet 
or even foreign artists like Van Gogh will argue a lot about the discovery of, uh, of this art. So here are some of the, um, the prints collected by Claude Monet. Uh, so you can see also the influence, you can think about the influence it has it had at this time on, um, on French uh, paintings, on impressionist, impressionist and um, on other movements. So you can see three of them. So they are, now they belong in the uh, Giverny Gallery. So the, the house of Claude Monet. Okay, so we can see as well that uh, it inspired a lot of paintings. So, and we can see also that the tea the tea time and the tea utensils were uh, depicted in the paintings. So here you can see, uh, for example, um, a painting by George Daniel de Montfred uh, from the first part of the 20th century, Tea at the Studio, where you can recognize easily the utensils uh, from the British tea time, we say, so um, the pot for the milk, etc. Another one. So we can see in these paintings the influence of Japanese techniques, just like uh, uh, frames, spots of colors, um, lines, but uh, still the, the utensils for tea and also the, um, the, decor I mean the decoration, everything is very occidental. But it's turning a bit uh, more oriental with Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt is an American artist, but she lived for almost half, all of her life in, uh, in France, in Paris, and she got into this movement of Japanese very early. You can see here one of her paintings and another one which deals with tea, where you can see two women uh, discussing about um, tea cups. Another one from Mekasa, very renowned. Um, so as we know, it will influence the artists and the artistic waves of the period, like Impressionism and Art Nouveau. Um, so you saw some paintings with the representation of tea time, but uh, we can also uh, quote that there are some utensils, like uh, not only the painting uh, area is influenced by Japanese, but also uh, crafts like ceramics. Like, uh, as you see here, a tea box uh, by um, Yves Terrien, uh, made at the Manufacture de Sèvres in, uh, a bit later. Um, some other tea boxes uh, from the Manufacture de Sèvres, which is uh, the most important um, structure, institution of uh, ceramics in France. And another one. Um, so, so here we are. With, so they are all influenced by the East, not only by Japan, and because you see here there are some influence also of Chinese art. Mm, but we can we can think that the tea sets will remain mostly occidental. So governments from both Japan and France are really proud of this collaboration and will participate largely in the diffusion of Japanese arts and crafts. And so here we are with the universal exhibitions. We have um, several universal exhibitions in Paris, happening in Paris. In um, 1867 will be the first, the first one in Paris. So um, that there will be in 1878, 1889, 1900 and 1925. Uh, 1868 in uh, Japan also, uh, also symbolizes the, um, the beginning of the Meiji era. So um, uh, also um, a will, there's also a will from the Japanese government to represent the modernization, to show to uh, Occid the Occidental world the, moderniz the modernization of uh, Japan. So, um, in the first, um, in this first exhibition, uh, universal exhibition at the Japanese pavilion, you can see the, um, a house, um, a representation of a house uh, of uh, the governor of Satsuma, uh, which is reconstructed entirely in the pavilion. So it's an architecture. And so here uh, there is a drawing um, where you can see one of the rooms 
with three ladies, uh, three Japanese ladies which came for it. Um, so here you can see the house of the Satsuma governor which was reconstructed there uh, in Paris. Here um, you can see another uh, drawing made by uh, Mr. Montand, uh, which is a journalist, which depicted a scene, um, a scene of, uh, of a tea time, of a Japanese traditional tea time, where you see um, someone making the service to a man uh, in Japanese traditional um, costume. So people would go, just people, uh, I mean, Parisian people would go and uh, have a look and discover a bit about the utensils, the traditions of, uh, of Japanese people. So this journalist, uh, which, which did the, um, the, other one, the other drawing, uh, said, gave a bit of a description of the house, he said, Instead of tables and chairs, the apartment is full of boxes, teacups, and flower pots. So he points out the importance of the teacups, the place of the teacups in the house. So there were a lot of teacups. Um, so this is an illustration which uh, was published in London, even if it was for the 1878 Universal Exhibition. Um, so, you can notice that there is also the use of, uh, of uh, an occidental teaware, like it seems like a, a tetsubin, and we can wonder if they, I mean, if they use it to adapt uh, to the occidental way of uh, drinking tea, or if there was uh, this fashion at the time in Japan as well. Um, tea is also very present in other illustrated supports and documents, like library resources, um, literary resources. So we will talk here a bit uh, more about Georges Bigot. Georges Bigot, you see his name written in, uh, in the PowerPoint. So Georges Bigot is an illustrator and he is a, tra uh, a traveler fascinated by Japan. He, he went to Japan really early in his life. He got married there and he wanted to stay there. So he gave um, French classes in Japan, and he, he tried really to make a living in Japan, and he was depicting all the, um, the, the common uh, situations in Japan, the professions, the traditional uh, ways of, of doing things, literally. And uh, also today, he's not really known in France, but in Japan, a uh, high school person or school, school students will, would um, study his drawings to know about the Meiji era, because he depicted really a lot of, of scenes that people, people, Japanese people wouldn't have the idea to, to depict, because they were, it was their daily life. So here you can see from his uh, book, Japanese Dinner, Professions, Portraits, and scenes, from, and scenes from Japan, the singing lesson, and the game of Go, where there is uh, also some tea utensils. So he would send to Paris, of course, all these publications. Uh, they were published in Paris, and people would, uh, would have access to these drawings. <clears throat> So you see all the scenes. Also, it depicted all the diplomatic events, like when uh, missionaries from France would come to Japan, what they would do, what were the activities. So we can see here uh, on the right. So also uh, in books of the time, like uh, fictions, there were kind of scenes of Japan because it was uh, really the fashion of the time, Japanism, so it would be not only in the paintings, but also in the literary resources. So, um, so Georges Bigot is an interesting, an interesting uh, character of the time, but there are also some uh, associations and societies which are uh, created at this time, like uh, La Société des Amis de l'Art Japonais, which is uh, basically an association founded by uh, Samuel or Siegfried Bing, which was an art gallerist, uh, which was fond, who, who was fond of Japan and of Japanese, Japanese art. And basically, he would meet uh, all of his clients and all of, 
everyone which would be interested in Japanese art in a restaurant and they would just uh, have dinner around uh, some Japanese prints, like uh, describing the prints, etc. And the thing is, is because this is the, public, the advertising for his dinners, and um, well, we see like a chawan, we see some, uh, we see a kiyosu, we see uh, the chazen, and we can think, okay, maybe they will do some demonstration of, uh, um, they would show how to use this utensil during the dinner, or maybe they would have tea the Japanese way during this dinner. Instead, there is really no resources, no mention about uh, Japanese tea drinking during these dinners, which um, I think but it's, it's a bit strange to not to have any mention of Japanese tea, whereas we had all the, de all the depictions of Japanese tea uh, utensils. Um, so, the Société de l'Amilar Japonais. So, we had also some places typical which opened around uh, the 20th century, like Le Divan Japonais, which is a really famous coffee. Uh, coffee and restaurants, uh, which is really known because Toulouse-Lautrec made a lot of uh, paintings in this place. And so here you can see typically uh, kind of um, picturesque, a bit, uh, um, yes, a bit picturesque advertising of the place with a Japanese woman serving tea. Uh, and we can make a, a parallel with uh, another uh, popular cafe of the time who served tea like uh, the, I mean, the British way, donc la Samaritaine. La Lanterne Japonaise was a review, like was um, a journal we would give in the, in the cabaret, in the coffees of the time. So here in this, uh, so already the name of course is influenced by Japanese and is all about, it's, it was not all about Japan in this review, in this journal, but it was um, talking about art, about, uh, I mean, uh, actuality. And uh, you can see, I don't know if you can see, see uh, you can see a bit uh, two women having tea uh, in a kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how it's, in a frame, like uh, if, it, if, it's as if it was a painting in the, in the room where the woman is standing. Um, so we can wonder about the tea market in Paris at the time um, because um, there were an interest for English arts and crafts and English traditionals, uh, traditions. And so um, tea was already consumed in France. In, in, I mean, it was not really popular because the uh, French people were more about coffee or, or herbal tea, but it began popular with this fashion of arts and crafts, of British arts and crafts, and also with uh, this fascination about uh, the East. So at the time, we would drink uh, overall blends, so herbal teas, uh, or herbal teas mixed with uh, black tea from China, usually. Uh, because of the price of the tea, but also because some um, medicals of the time used to say it's more digest, it's more digest if you consume tea with another plant or with another ingredient like chocolate as well. So um, tea houses are emerging in Paris at the time and they sell teas from China and India where they're directly uh, trading with uh, China, where they're indirectly uh, via the UK. So you see here uh, popular tea houses, uh, Mariage Frère, which is uh, still today Im very important. Uh, Té Lombard, which was um, a place for chocolate, a chocolatery, but uh, they sold also tea. And Té de la Porte Chinoise, so tea from the Chinese door. Uh, which are uh, which were really dealing with the Chinese teas, uh, all about Chinese tea. Té Lombard uh, advertisement is uh, interesting because they show a Japanese woman and they sell, uh, as they say, importation direct, direct importation. So we could wonder if um, they could have Japanese tea at the time directly from Japan, and uh, or if it's just uh, an advertising and a kind of market, marketing process. So here you can see, oh, it's not really, the quality is really bad, but I couldn't uh, 
find better uh, so the interior of a tea house at the time. Um, so, uh, the, actually, when we look at the um, diplomatic archives from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which would send every year a report from the importation and exportation of all the countries, um, usually they say uh, that the Russians would get, uh, would get an end on the most expensive and prestigious teas from China, and that every other country would have all the other teas which would be uh, Kugu tea at the time it was called. It was like uh, Kimun tea or black teas mainly from China. Oh, only from China, actually. Um, so from Fujian, uh, indeed. And uh, some bases like, uh, from, for English breakfast teas in uh, this type of thing. So um, we, can we can say that the advertising from Telombar is more kind of marketing with importation, direct importation written because um, Japanese tea was not sold uh, in, uh, in France at the time. Indeed, we can uh, have a look on the tea importation. So here we have um, a table of exportation of Chinese tea in 1876, but there is a, um, a resource for every year. And we can see here, uh, so, England is really uh, at the head of the importation of teas, and you, have, you, don't, have, you don't even have France. It's, like, uh, it's included in uh, Europe continent, and uh, it's way, uh, way less importation. Um, so we can uh, just say that in America, American tea imports from Japan and China was, were really different than French ones, because as you see... Uh, Okay, um, because Americans would buy all the Japanese teas, uh, Japanese tea exploitation, basically, so green teas mostly. Um, so they would have all the markets, and uh, French people would, wouldn't just have access to the market. And in, eight, in 1890, uh, the French consul uh, of Yokohama gets ashamed of this situation and wishes France would import more than only silk. And even in this, in this field, in the field of silk and textile, uh, France would, um, would get um, overwhelmed by U.S. market. Uh, so this, uh, this student at the chancellery at the time, uh, which uh, is called Le Feuve Méol, uh, wrote in 1890, <coughs> he explains the fact uh, of the dominance of foreigners uh, in the tea market in Japan by the, by the, um, for the reason that uh, even if French people would go there, they would, uh, as there were already some markets, some uh, foreigners like from America or from England, they wouldn't have access in, the, um, in this market, so they would just uh, let go because um, they, were, they were not really competitive in this field as uh, French people wouldn't consume it. So, as a conclusion, we can say that uh, even if we had a lot of uh, knowledge about Japanese tea utensils at this time, these Japanese uh, utensils would just be like museum objects. They would just remain in galleries or in museums and just wouldn't go away from, uh, from this kind of, uh, of the artist world and uh, wouldn't be used even uh, even if, uh, if they could have, do so, but uh, and they wouldn't have any, t any Japanese tea as well, so we, can't, we don't know if there was a demand for it, or, if, um, or merely if people from France didn't really, um, were not really enthusiastic about Japanese tea, and so just uh, uh, were okay with uh, Chinese tea and Indian tea. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Now we thank Ms. Pregeron for her very interesting presentation, and unusual, I would say, also.